Welcome to Build today. Super excited to have a really special guest, Nate Walkingshaw from Pluralsight. Um, he's the Chief Experience Officer at Pluralsight. He's the author or the co-author of the book on product leadership. Yeah. And super excited to have him here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. No, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pumped. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff <clears throat> I want to get into, especially on your take on products and product outcomes. But first, I would love to hear your story of how you got from being an EMT to a Chief Experience Officer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so long story short is I did never think I would be in product management. I didn't mm -hmm. think I'd be the chief experience officer. Like if you looked at who I was then, like patient care, even to this day, is uh, one of the most important things that I love mm -hmm. uh, and I loved about being um, an EMT back in the day. But yeah, I, I started out as an emergency medical technician. I worked in the field for uh, five years full time. Um, and, and that's just <coughs> in the ambulance Saving lives. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and what was crazy is that that's the whole reason empathy, that's a, my origin story, is the reason why I feel like I'm a much better product leader or product manager is because, you know, there's this moment in the back of the ambulance that is really tender <clears throat> and helps you see things from really affluent to really marginalized communities um, and the problems that, that are kind of each person is faced with that mm -hmm. you begin to unpack and understand at a really young age. It changed my life forever and um, sent me on a totally different trajectory. But the why I ended up here was more about when I was in Fire and EMS, there are just a lot of opportunities to invent things mm -hmm. to help us, help the EMTs. So while you're in the ambulance, yeah. you're thinking of ways that you oh, can there's make tons it more of efficient. Stuff, there's yeah. tons of stuff going on back yeah, there. Yeah. That it's like, man, this industry has not like had any like looks for, right. for 20, 30, 40 years. And essentially, like our ambulance cot was a folding ironing board. And like healthy people don't call 911. And so, you know, you're going on all these calls, you know, you do six to 11 calls per day. And sure enough, a lot of the partners that I had were going to light duty because of back injuries. And that's mm -hmm. where I started inventing products to solve those problems. So did you have a background in R&D or was this just like tinkering, just oh, coming no. up with stuff? Because you Yeah, were... nothing whatsoever. I mean, li literally, I, I drew it out on a napkin. The cool thing about the Fire and EMS space is that, look, you have to work 10 days a month. Like it's a Kelly schedule mm -hmm. uh, normally. So if you're 10 days or maybe it's 248s or whatever, mm -hmm. most of us are working second jobs. Right. And so a lot of the people that I worked with that were working second jobs, landscaping, mowing lawns, but one of these uh, firefighters that I knew super well was actually, he owned a, mach a machine shop. Oh, yeah. okay. So when I so came you had up, access to somewhere you could yeah. kind of like. So like, when I came up with the tracks, he allowed me to go into the machining shop mm -hmm. and take 60, 61 aluminum and shave 40 thousandths off it to learn how like a manual mill and lathe would work. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, you know, no, I had no craft, no training. Yeah. It was all learned by doing. It was all hands-on awesome. application of knowledge. And yeah, that was kind of the birth of the descent control system, these track systems that mounted the bottom of the ambulance car. So Stryker sees this, snaps you guys up. How, and then you spent some time there, yeah. and then yeah, I was in there. This is still in hardware. So then, how did you make the leap over yeah. software? <laughs> Everyone always asks. So, so okay, it's hardware. I mean, at Stryker, we we're doing amazing things there. If you mm -hmm. if you look at the and I'm, this is specifically the emergency medical space division. Yep. Uh, you know, you have Power Pro and Power Load. What Power Pro is is a powered ambulance cot. And then what we ended up doing there is low energy Bluetooth RFID, mm -hmm. right? That all of a sudden would recognize power load, which is basically a lifting and loading system to lift the ambulance caught and the patient into the back of the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so that that's like really the foray from hardware into hardcore software. Okay. Now we'd already done a ton of IOT stuff with the move chair, which was a powered stair chair. Okay. And so we were in offshore oil and gas platforms in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, teaching paramedics how to vertically evacuate their injured personnel to the helicopter helicopter deck. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was all software, potentiometers, a lot of RFID. So there, we'd already done a ton of okay. software elements yeah. uh, at Paramed, but I'm talking like what I would say legit, massive scale, 150 different countries, mm -hmm. like repeatable mm -hmm. uh, stuff. And, you know, human lives were at stake. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was where all those chops, you know, got shaped. I could see how that would force you to be a little bit more careful with yeah, what you were doing. Yeah, just a tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like most product teams are like, well, no one's going to die. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, actually. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then you went from there. There was a brief period Strava. Yeah. I'm a huge fan, <clears> so... Any inside scoop on Strava? Yeah, I mean, Strava's amazing. I mean, uh, I love Strava. 
So we created a product development company, Brightface, you know, mm -hmm. after the exit of Stryker, and we launched a product called Cycleface. Hopefully there's some Cycleface fans out here watching this. But essentially what Cycleface was is we connected to your Strava profile and mm -hmm. then Nike Fuel Band at the time and Garmin mm -hmm. GPS. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we, we created this algorithm, uh, which was super rad. What it would do is it would scrape all of your rides off of Strava, mm -hmm. and then it would tie basically this nutritional plan. Oh. Um, so basically it was subscription nutrition based off your specific oh. riding style. So the goal was is that within 48 hours of you running out of nutrition, we would drop a box of nutrition on your door. And so oh, so it wasn't just like here's a plan, but it was no, actual. No, it was totally legit. Totally legit on how you huh. on how you rode. That's so cool. every single month, <clears throat> based off of your riding style on Strava, we could give you some personalized level of nutrition, and it took off like super super fast. Yeah, we had some unsolicited, uh, you know, offers from different companies right away, and I'll just tell you, I mean, as as you know, it's like the Strava team. Uh, totally aligned with our mission, our vision, who we were. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically a lot of the team that was there were really close friends already. And so they awesome. flew in quickly and snapped uh, that up. So what was cool about the Strava piece mm -hmm. was we helped Strava launch the first iteration of shop.strava.com because they were really just an endurance athlete company at that yeah. time. They yeah. hadn't launched any commerce-based application, mm -hmm. but yet we were buying so much product for them yeah. You know, all the time, whether it was, you know, Strava swag or whatever. So Jordan and that whole team, we, you know, we got acquired and then we were able to help those guys launch their, their first commerce-based application, which was super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you went athletes, <clears throat> nutrition. Yeah. How did you get to Pluralsight? Yeah. <laughs> so I was at OC Tanner for a little while mm -hmm. and I was like the head of Tanner Labs there. Okay. So the quick story is that the CIO at OC Tanner mm -hmm. was this, you know, this thought leader, um, you know, around you know, technology evolution and mm -hmm. change. Well, well, we finished a board meeting at Tanner and it literally was just a, a quick conversation in labs at OC Tanner. It's like, hey, there's this company called Pluralsight and um, they're interested in, you know, engaging me to make a course, do you wanna come? So I just jumped in the car just because. It was right. like, I had no intention. I didn't even know who Pluralsight was. Mm -hmm. And so launched up there and a hallway conversation, I'm walking up the stairs at Pluralsight, this, you know, acquisitions editor, Matt, talked to Neil and as we were walking down Aaron mm -hmm. the founder was walking up and Matt turned to Aaron is like hey because he really wanted Neil to do courses okay and he's like hey could you like you know could you come to lunch with us because he was right, trying right. to close Neil yeah so I went to lunch uh, at Sushi Monster and I'm sitting across from Aaron the founder which who I didn't know right and, and you're just sort of along for the ride yeah I'm just along for the yeah. ride yeah I don't I'm just like whatever yeah <laughs> and so Aaron's like you know who are you and I'm like yeah I'm this guy and he's and I'm like so who are you and he's like well I'm the founder of Pluralsight I'm like oh okay sweet <laughs> I didn't I didn't know that <laughs> so as we started dialoguing um, man the mission of Pluralsight mm -hmm. democratizing technology skills and really what really what sits at the heart of that is you know, opportunity is not equally distributed. Right. And that's the heart and the soul mm -hmm. of the mission of the company is that we believe it's just access. Yep. If you can give access and people you can you can give the knowledge, mm -hmm. then honestly we can set ourselves free. And uh, it was an easy choice. Like I, I left Tanner, you know, mm -hmm. almost immediately after that to go uh, to go build product for, you know, for uh, Pluralsight. Cool. So you've had all of those different experiences building all sorts of different products. How did that shape the sort of framework that you came up with? There, I, I would say that the biggest sphere of influence in the whole entire kind of directed discovery process mm -hmm. is actually the human-centered design piece. Okay. And honestly, that life skill was crafted from the back of the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that's the hugest part of the influence of the methodology, at least, um, or the thinking that influenced the framework of it. The, the other piece was just failure. I failed a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I just didn't have, like early in my career, and I don't know about you or you know other people that are listening, but I was pretty cocky. Like mm -hmm. about like, when I was a paramedic, I actually thought that every single paramedic was like me. And so when I developed the first solutions or products, mm -hmm. um, I had so much confirmation bias that like I was designing the right solution for right, people. Because it worked for you and it was yeah, obvious. That's right. Yeah, definitely. And so the whole purpose of the framework, one, is way more about the people. It'll develop a great product. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point of it is confirmation bias of teams and then okay. centering all those decisions around a customer or a user 
and then the user at the end of the day breaks the tie. See, great product development doesn't have me or the team in it. Like okay. our confirmation bias isn't in there. What's in there is real qualitative and quantitative feedback and aggregated research that actually gives you the meat on the bone, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's the difference maker. And so the whole point of the philosophical approach is really to build the most psychologically safe team possible so that you can have honest conversations about what you're seeing, thinking, feeling, hearing, and doing mm-hmm. with the product that you're trying to you know, organize around. Yep. And that's like the, the overall impetus of, of the framework. And just being really real with yourself, we'll get into outcomes, but yeah. the quantitative piece, like mm-hmm. the what you're trying to create for the world yep. is the why. Like this is the what, what problem are we trying to solve mm-hmm. and why does it matter? And then how do we honestly look at that problem to kind of unpack it? Okay. So is the framework, is directed discovery the framework or is, is it the thing I printed out? Oh, the heartbeat of a product? Yeah. So, so I just did that... Um, so that was my mind the product talk. Okay. Uh, so that the point of the healthy product heart mm-hmm. was basically taking directed discovery. Um, and this is an interplay for my personal life, but yep. that's a normal sinus rhythm. So NSR, yeah. so for paramedics. And it's basically taking all of the key elements that I think you need to have to develop a product. And this mm-hmm. is what a healthy heart would look like. Right. Um, and then yeah. I did I did a fun play on, you know, tachycardia. So that's like super fast. Yep. You know, a bradycardia, which is super slow. And those apply to the companies that we work in. Like there's really slow product development and it's because there's a ton of missing pieces or Mm -hmm. silos Mm -hmm. uh, or they're not psychologically safe. Yep. There's lots of cool, fun facts you and I can talk about on why I feel like those things are, will fail. Okay, well first, directed discovery. Yeah. What's the high level, high speed, like what is it? Yeah, so so it's, huh. (laughs) It's basically, kind of philosophical framework. I want you to don't think of it as a process. Okay. Like it's just mile markers. Okay. So every company that I've worked at for I'd say the last, you know, 20ish years, like I've I've needed some type of guardrails for myself, for the team, um, you know, to understand or orient ourselves, you know, around the why. Mm-hmm. And there's really kind of a, a, a series of elements, but one is the mission. Mhm. It has to be super clear. The vision has to be super clear. And the other thing is just who you're building for and mm-hmm. why you're trying to solve those problems. A lot of our industry, you know, knows them as personas. Uh, people get way aggro on, you know, personas. It's more about the behavioral model modeling behind the persona than it is about like the, you know, kind of four bar persona chart we've all been used to. The other piece is voice of the customer. Okay. So being able to capture their voice, which I think is the biggest missing element. Okay. So at Pluralsight, we've done over 9,000 qualitative interviews in three and a half years. That's a lot. Yeah, so most of our teams do around 60 interviews a week. Okay. So I'd say- I'd Are say, those like structured user oh, yeah. interviews? Yep. Wow. Yeah, so like on blue jeans um, mm-hmm. or immersion state, mm-hmm. uh, and they're all recorded. Um, and it just depends. Like the the process that we use is is uh, is unique. If it's innovation, if it's a plus one, if you're trying to squash bugs, you're doing mm-hmm. different things in that. Okay. But the second half is prototype observation. We call mm-hmm. it CPT, which is customer preference testing. And then the last half is CCT, which is customer confirmation testing, which really oh, is quantitative okay. analysis. So that every single design that we ship, um, you know, has a big data layer that sits underneath the design comps, mm-hmm. and it's giving you qualitative and quantitative feedback the second that you release it into. And we have staged releases; we're continuous delivery. Okay. Yep. So you know, when you release it to a small subset of users, I can see sentiment analysis, I can mm-hmm. see qualitative feedback, and I can also see a quant score. Okay. And so before it ever makes it into production, we we know if we've got something that's going to work. So did you, when you dropped into Pluralsight, was this all built? Yeah. This was all set up already. <clears throat> yeah. No, no. Oh, oh was DD in plural site? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. Okay, I was. I'm no, like, no. There was eight. This is incredible. Eight, no, how, no, like, no. how did you get to this place? Yeah. <laughs> there, no, there were eight engineers. Okay. Yeah, like the story at plural site was awesome because when I got there four years ago, um, it was a monolithic web app. Okay. Right. It was in two languages, .NET and Angular. It was on prem. Great. You know, and so yeah, this was this was a full rebuild from the ground up, moving mm-hmm. it onto the cloud, native iOS, Roku, Chromecast, Apple TV. No product management or user experience design in the business. Well, there was two or three product managers, but they mm-hmm. were in marketing, kind of project oh. managing sales requests. Yep. Okay. At, at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So as far as a formal product function at Plural Site, no. 
So, so this was an opportunity to come in and just sort of like from the ground up, yeah. do it the right way. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, everyone has their right way. This yeah. was the right way as it, as it like pertains to me mm-hmm. um, and my product development experience. Yeah. But there's like every person who's in product thinks their way is the right way. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't that's know. why I'm doing this just so I can steal all of your <laughs> right ways for that's, myself. That's cool. I want to talk specifically about product outcomes because yeah, I think a lot of these themes of, you know, having a clear mission, you know, however you do it, talking to customers constantly, like yeah. we all know we're supposed to do that kind of thing, yeah. theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. Um, but outcomes specifically, I think when I, especially early on in my career, thinking about becoming a product manager, it was always solve the pro- customer problems, find yeah. the customer problems and solve them. But now I'm hearing solve for product <clears throat> outcomes. Yeah. So like, what does that actually mean and how have you sort of helped your team do yeah. that? Yeah, I think, I mean, kind of a really clear, I have a couple of buckets in my head when I Mm -hmm. think about outcomes. Okay. Um, One of the buckets is, you know, kind of the the thing that we know Mm -hmm. a lot about, which is key performance indicators. And that that is like really more of an intrinsic look, like inside of the business model. Okay. And so, you know, you're building a product that, you know, builds, you know, maybe some type of impact or economic, um, you know, or happiness for the intrinsic financial model of the companies we work for. Mm-hmm. I think outcomes is, is actually quite a bit different and yeah. it's more of an extrinsic point of view that I have. Mm-hmm. So I'll use Pluralsight as a really good example here of kind of how we think about kind of a, an outcome model. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing that we should, you know, that we're not talking about is outputs because that's, okay. that's actually the thing that we're trying to... That's a thing. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, that's a thing. You know that's a thing, yeah. right? It's because it's ship dates. Mm-hmm. Um, so the outputs, like all of us, you know, have been in product for years, have been on like kind of these, you know, death marches to ship thing by a certain date. Yeah. Uh, not cool. Outputs aren't necessarily bad. Like we have to be committed and accountable to the company to ship something, you know, within a time frame. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more about how it gets measured and what it creates is kind of where I'd want to spend the most time. Okay. So for instance, I'm going to, I'll use a good example. Kind of the three anchor tenants, if you will, for key performance indicators mm-hmm. is likelihood to buy, length mm-hmm. of stay, and mm-hmm. NPS. And there's okay. lots of like crazy uh, experiences around net promoter score. And the net promoter score is not the score. We don't focus on the score. We mm-hmm. focus on the qualitative feedback and the sentiment analysis in NPS data. So that's helping inform, right, mm-hmm. basically the overall behavioral aspects of the product and how they're experiencing um, right. But the first two, le- length, uh, length mm-hmm. of stay, that's usage. So yeah. that's really understanding, you know, um, do these people really enjoy? Are they surprised and delighted by the product that we've built? And then likelihood to buy uh, really is billings or revenue. So mm-hmm. that's like a really intrinsic look um, mm-hmm. for us. The, the thing, if, if the mission of our company is to democratize technology skills and we're to teach individual learners new technology skills to take with them, then that's impact. So right. it's, it's actually how they apply their knowledge once they've learned something. Mm-hmm. So that's an outcome. So the outcome is the outcome for the customer. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I think that's like one of the key pieces that I've been hearing is that it's not it's not looking internal. It's no. not saying, oh, we're going to build this thing. It's going to do that's this. Right. You know, they're going to buy it. Yeah, because look, the, if I nail the outcome with the individual learner, mm-hmm. right, the other three things that I just gave you, they kind of handle themselves. Right. In the same way that you were talking about NPS and I, your NPS score is really amazing. Yeah. I saw it on one of the blog posts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've, I mean, we've done a lot of work, but it's because we're listening to what they want. Mm-hmm. We're delivering it and then we're having impact, mm-hmm. right, which is, you know, creating some type of you know, application of knowledge or, yeah. you know, skilling up. So we've, we've, you know, we've put measurements around that. Like, how do you want to quantify, you know, those things within Pluralsight? Well, mm-hmm. you know, skill IQ is a thing for us. It's, you know, it's a cool little testing algorithm that we have. Mm-hmm. So within five minutes or 20 test questions-ish, um, we can actually understand or give you a score, a skill IQ, you know, in Angular, in any software development language or mm-hmm. IT ops. So what's interesting about that is that's a skill outcome. So that somebody learned something, applied their knowledge, and mm-hmm. then took an assessment to see, you know, where they were, oh, okay, and right, they got scaled up, and yeah. then got better. And so that's creating impact for them in their personal life, and it's mm-hmm. also creating impact for the company because now they know they have a person that they can count on that actually has the skills that they need right. in Angular. And like, look, there's a huge theme out there, like the digital transformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like super cliche. Like the under the under the hood of that is you know, the real work, which is, you know, you're going from on-prem to the cloud. Well, that looks like COBOL into Java. 
and that could be thousands of developers that know COBOL mm -hmm. with an average tenure of 15 years, yep. trying to learn a new language or framework, and they're trying to write new software into Java. That mm -hmm. is impact, that is outcome. So yeah. how do I move all of those individual developers from COBOL engineers you know, into Java engineers? And right. we want to measure that piece. That okay. piece is important to us. So how, like, talking to someone who is sort of has less of a broad scope. Yeah. How can they take what they're doing today and like turn it into an outcome focus? Yeah, that's is, this great. Like, is it just reframing the problem that they're solving? Like how how can people start doing that right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the I mean, where do you start is kind of yeah. what I hear there. Yeah. So the, if you don't understand the first three things, like the mm -hmm. the usage of your product, right, the length of stay or the billings, like the actual value that you're generating for whatever you've given them, yep. and if they're happy about it. Mm -hmm. If you don't know those two things, it's really hard to do anything else we just talked about. Right. Because I don't know if I'm actually going to impact those outcomes or not. Okay. I, I have no idea. So the core of this is go grab, if you're a su subscription business today, mm -hmm. you know, go grab all of your subscriber data yep. and go look at, you know, the likelihood to buy, so your subscription revenue for that cohort look at their usage patterns and see if they're happy. Because the best thing about this exercise is it tells you what not to do. Okay, give me an example. Yeah, it's great. So we, you know, at Pluralsight, we didn't start out as the technology learning platform. We were a learning platform. Okay. And that could have been, you know, I could have, there could have been like beer making classes, yeah. you know, on there. You know, like, so where do you focus? How do you focus? Mm -hmm. Well, when you <clears throat> go and do this analysis, it was pretty easy to see that the people that loved what we did mm -hmm. and paid us the most amount of money and stayed the longest in our app and were super happy were software developers. Huh, okay. Okay, but when you looked outside a one step, two step or five step adjacency, like people that were out there that were not really developing content for mm -hmm. and we're like, we had, I remember we had wedding planning videos, I think in there, like it was, it was cool. Uh, those people, they weren't staying long. They were churning out of our product. Their yep. utilization was low. And mm -hmm. like the happiness score was pretty bad. And the reason why is because we hadn't built a personalized experience for them, mm -hmm. right? The content really matched or meet their needs, mm -hmm. you know, in their moment of need. So that's what I'm talking about. It's like, how do you create an outcome for a software developer? Well, look, that learning experience for a developer, very, very different than right. someone that's a creative. Yeah. Right? Because they're visual learners. Mm -hmm. Like developers are command efforts and they want to search and get back into workflow. Yeah. Creatives are like immersive and like they want to, you know, dive in. So that's a great way to look at, you know, li length of stay, likelihood to buy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and NPS. So once I start from there, then I can say, okay, this is who the customer is. This is who we're building for. What problems are we going to solve? Mm -hmm. And that was the last thing I said, which is, so we want to give them a skill. We want to teach them something right. to skill them up. And so now we want to measure the outcome of the time it takes them to learn and grasp, you know, and attach a skill IQ mm -hmm. to their profile. So average number of skill IQs per an individual learner, that's really important to us. And it's because they've gone on a learning journey, they've applied that knowledge, and then they've actually given themselves an artifact mm -hmm. that measures it. Yeah, that's true. Is that cool? Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's, I'm just trying to think about how we could measure those outcomes for our customers. Yeah. And we have some ways that we can do it because we're sort of involved in the buying cycle with them. <clears throat> but I think that's interesting for people to think about sometimes the impact might be something they can't measure. Yeah. So how could they get a, get some sense of whether what they're doing is actually providing, creating the outcome for their customers that they wanted to? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I, I mean, I don't want to say that there's vanity ways, but there are mm -hmm. looser outcomes mm -hmm. um, for us. So I'll give you social proofing as a good, yeah. like as a good one. So <clears throat> for skill IQs, what you can do with skill IQs is attach them to your LinkedIn profile. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like that could be a, another way. If I didn't have any of that other data, mm -hmm. you know, I could look at the day that we launched skill IQ, the number of skill IQs and the attach rate mm -hmm. right in the open social sphere and then see if that started to gravitate to, you know, statistical significance. Right. So have people decided to put that on Stack Overflow profile, you mm -hmm. know, uh, LinkedIn? Is it showing up on any other credential for job interviews and resumes? Yeah. Like, so that's a great way to know that, okay, this credential is representing their body of knowledge. It's yep. actually showing up in front of the rest of the world and they're using it, you know, to maybe scale up or get a job or a new job or a promotion. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. How, when you were coming up with this framework and implementing it at Plural Site, like how did you teach the team about it? Yeah. Was it easy? Did it take a long time? Do we have hours to talk? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, it's the the way that we implemented it was in phases. Okay. We really had to break it into these like three buckets, right? Which was, hey, mission and vision, 
Mm -hmm. right along with uh, personas the second one is actually like teaching teams the product management UX and engineering skills around how to conduct like voice of customer interviews okay the you know the next element really is is the the voice of the customer piece mm -hmm. and you know ethnography like learning how to read body language mm -hmm. you know arms folded legs crossed eye mm -hmm. contact you know tonality like all of that that, that awesome work that it takes to kind of unpack really what's going on underneath the hood. Yep. The other thing is that, you know, things that are nuanced, product management, UX and Eng, like their roles in our organization as far as what they do, how they work, like they blur the lines when, it's, when it's in discovery work, mm -hmm. it, they're all blurring. Like an engineer will do an interview. They'll moderate yeah. a full blown interview. They'll do all of the questions. Right. Um, and we feel really strongly about that here, that the whole team <clears throat> is part of that process and everyone's talking to customers all the time. Yeah. And and like for instance, like how committed we are to it, if if an engineer can't make a voice of the customer interview, we mm -hmm. cancel it. So what's part three? Yeah, and then part three is the customer confirmation piece. You know, how to do uh, CCT. So how do you embed analytics and what things do you want to measure? What, what types of things do you care about? Okay. And that's really the qualitative and quantitative feedback on the releases mm -hmm. and then also the outcomes. So like, okay. are you starting to like see some um, proof points around the outcomes and then also is the experience the second you give it to them is it actually meeting their you know user experience needs task flow yeah. you know, needs yeah. okay and the last piece is that in CCT is data right the data science ML kind of AI side we haven't gone deep there but when you're using a lot of you know recommendations or inference right mm -hmm. you're testing the data science model that you've built that's been engineered into the behavioral model of you know the user yep. and so you're you're wanting to make sure that those things are airtight as well how how does the team remain flexible and responsive to customer needs when uh -huh. there's like so much like <clears throat> so many steps yeah it's organizational design okay. so i mean they're all cross functional co-located they all mm -hmm. sit together and the f the frame of dd that i've just give, kind of given you mm -hmm. remember those are, those are mile markers so right. th the point that i'm trying to make is if I've got, you know, 30, which we have, you know, 35 or almost 40 of those teams today, mm -hmm. like the way that they use their discovery interview process, mm -hmm. the VOC, the way they capture it, we don't yep. care. Like every, okay. sing every single person has their different interview style. Mm -hmm. the, the point is, is that the when they actually ship something into production, it's um, making sure that they're delivering value mm -hmm. that doesn't have confirmation bias in it or gender bias in it. Like right. it, you have to give something that like is tangible mm -hmm. because watch what happens if you ship something that doesn't work you mm -hmm. actually need something to go reference to know where the team actually created the mistakes so mm -hmm. you know in that voice of customer or in the prototype it's super clear for our team to say okay like i obviously you know jaded this design a certain way to kind right. of present an experience and like we have had these problems um, it's just the old days is like we used to just build and ship, throw it over the wall, ship it, mm -hmm. and then find out that they didn't like it or if they did or didn't like, we didn't really know. Mm -hmm. the, the point is, is you want to avoid the actual writing of the codes, right? So you have a high degree of confidence right. that like you're building the right thing. My question would be for people who are at teams that are sort of earlier stage who might not have the time. Yeah. Like how do you approach that question? Like, like sometimes it might be faster just to code something. Yeah, well, there there are times uh, that I think that totally applies. Mm -hmm. So, like, if it's if it's a new idea that you've never done, that's high risk just to code it up and launch it. Right. I think that's high risk. Mm -hmm. Like when when there is a better way, and it's like I mean, when we talk mm -hmm. about speed, was it at another twelve hours? I mean, to like go do a couple of interviews to find out, okay, we're directionally right. Yeah. Like so, like I would I'd push on the well time. There are things like if I if I have a high degree of certainty, like yep. something's in prod and I need to squish some bugs, you're not mm -hmm. doing any of that stuff. Right. But if it is like a plus one that's going to change like the flow, the affordances, mm -hmm. then it's probably worth like just like some co covering your rear end a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and doing some qualitative interviews and then punching it back out to production just to make sure that you're good. Because like, look, the the risk, this is your brand. Mm -hmm. Like this is your product, this is your experience. Right. So the second you give something to the world, like you can't take it back. Like, mm -hmm. so if someone, if someone listening wants to learn how to actually put this all into place, yeah. is there a resource? <laughs> yeah. Is there a course? <laughs> well, on um, so uh, I, I mean, I've I've tr I've just tried to give everything away for free. Mm -hmm. So every if you just go to medium.com mm -hmm. and Walking Shaw, like everything around, you know, directed discovery and then. 
I have part one, two, and three. It's actually a pretty big series, but I put mm-hmm. an awesome playlist in there so you knew the mood I was in when I was writing it. That's awesome. It's a pretty sweet playlist. Um, but basically, that whole part one, two, and three series is the double click into this work. Yeah, I think okay. there's a ton of content out there, plus the book, Product Leadership. Yeah, so I have one quote that I asked Martin about that I want to ask you about as oh, well, boy. which is my favorite one from the book, Yeah, which is the one about daily swims in the sea of ambiguity. <laughs> so you just gave us this whole framework on yeah. how to have less ambiguity, but still that's sort of the essential part of being in product. Yeah. Like, what does that quote mean to you? Yeah, I mean, that uh, that embodies the work that we do, I think. Mm-hmm. I, the framework, honestly, like that, those little milestones in mm-hmm. there, it's honestly just to help me orient my mind around, you know, what what we're doing. Yep. Uh, and I know that between, you know, companies being in a startup or, you know, you guys could be big, you know, these companies could be big. Mm-hmm. You know, the what looks like big to Pluralsight today is, you know, like, let's just call it a million learners, you know, okay. or just out there doing their thing. Mm-hmm. That feels heavy to me right as a as a leader right yeah. like i feel a huge amount of responsibility to mm-hmm. take care you know and craft a really meaningful experience um it wasn't any different when it was 250,000 learners or 50,000 learners um right it's still lives it, it is still lives and i think if you come at it from that place mm-hmm. uh and you really care about your craft morally and ethically about your craft mm-hmm. uh you bring to- together great diversity of thought and you try and put your arms around that ambiguity a tiny bit with, mm-hmm. with I think, um, core principles that test those elements that I just disclosed. Yeah. I think that's where magic happens. I think that's when, you know, you get to build something beautiful for people. Yeah. And, and I think the team feels totally different. Mm-hmm. And really it is. I mean, you know how it is working with teams. Yeah. Like you want to feel great about what you're creating. You want to feel that mm-hmm. you've changed, you know, the human condition in some positive way. Um, and I think that's like ultimately if those are the team outcomes, it's a, uh, it's a cool, cool thing to have happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, okay. Last question. If you had to give everyone listening just a couple pieces of ad- pieces of advice that they can take back and put into practice right now. Really relating, like listening. Like, I think we don't listen enough. And I think, you know, when you work with teams and you're trying to work through really tough problems together, um, it's amazing what happens when someone feels hurt. Mm-hmm. So if you sit and have a conversation with someone to really intentionally hear mm-hmm. and then play back what they're what they're saying to you and then get a nod like the like the thing we're doing right now, like I'm getting great social currency from you right now <laughs> is because you're giving me nods. Like I know that you're actually listening right. to what I say. Right. But we don't really do that that much in practice. And I'll tell you right now, like we're super focused on phones. We're super mm-hmm. focused on screens like that's mm-hmm. kind of our job. Today, like technology is infused into everything we do. Mm-hmm. But when you are actually interacting with your teams, you know, human to human, yep. honestly, like the art of relating, like relating with another person to listen to them, to play them back, to let them feel heard, watch what happens. Like there's this opening between like people and it creates this awesome sense of connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's where, I think that's, you know, what we need to do more of. Okay. Yeah. So listen? Listen, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Nate, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. <laughs> um, and to everyone listening, obviously, shout out Nate in the reviews. Six stars only. I need a couple more six star reviews. Nice. What everyone does that mean? Six stars? I want some six stars. Yeah, it's Can I get um, Apple doesn't have them yet, but we're on a campaign to get them. Oh, let's get six yeah, stars. Six then. stars. Yeah, okay, six, six stars. stars. Shout Hashtag it out. Six stars. And give me some feedback, Maggie at Jeff.com. Thanks.